whether you're desperately waiting for your first EV to arrive or you've already got one and you're a bit freaked out by it all, I thought I would compile a list of the top 10 things to think about as an EV owner. I know this isn't some cynical ploy just to get referral cash from you, but if you do click any of the links in the video, thank you very much in advance. So here we go then, the top 10 things that you probably need as an EV owner. Okay, probably the most important thing, charging the car. Now, if you're lucky enough to have a driveway, you can, of course, charge using what's in this box. This is affectionately known as a granny charger. It's also called a portable charger or some car manufacturers call it an emergency charger. And that's what it is. It's this box and it's got a normal plug at the end of it. Now, these are really good in that the moment you get your car, you can just plug it into the wall, just like you plug in your phone or whatever else. So if you have this plugged into the wall, it generates a lot of heat and it's doing it for hours and hours and hours. So I know it's not always possible, but if you can, if you have to use a granny charger, get an outdoor socket like this on a protected circuit and weather resistant, it's just much safer. You might find you can reduce the amps on the granny charger. So if you can do that, then obviously it makes it a bit safer if you're not convinced the socket is any good. Consider this a kind of a temporary solution. What you really need is a dedicated wall box like this. The one that we've got is called a Zappi. And I was really excited when I got this. And in fact, I made a video about it. Check that out if you want to see me looking like an Alien 3 extra. It's not pretty. That's living the dream. It's having an electric car and charging directly with solar. It's linked up to the solar panels. So any solar I get goes onto here. I've got 0.1 kilowatts, not much at the moment. If you have your car plugged in and you've got a decent amount of solar, then you can trickle charge the car just using solar. So that means you are charging for free. And that's the wonderful thing about this wall box. I think others probably do that as well, but Zappi was the one that got everyone's attention. And the app is really good. So check out my video if you haven't seen it already. If you like the idea of getting a wall box, then you've got a budget for about £1,200. It varies, you can get cheaper ones, but that's probably about how much it will cost for a Zappi with installation. Loads of chargers available, and do check out my friend Nick Ramo. He's done fantastic reviews of all the chargers available. Look at that and see which one works best for you. Now, if you do have the luxury of being able to charge at home, what you really want is an off-peak tariff. Because if you've got an off-peak tariff, it means you can charge when the electricity is cheap and you will save an absolute fortune if you do that. The tariff we're on with Octopus is called Octopus Go. And with Octopus Go, you get four hours of off-peak cheap rate during the night from half 12 to half four in the morning. So we tend to put our dishwasher on then, we tend to put washing machine on then, and we also charge the car at that point. So we save quite a lot of money, 12 pence per kilowatt hour for the night rate and 43.4 pence per kilowatt hour for day rate with a 41.13 pence per day standing charge, which is ridiculous, but Octopus don't have any control over the standing charge, I believe. That's how much it is for us now. But it means you can drive the car really for pennies. I mean, you're talking like three pence per mile or something like that. I don't want to blow Octopus's trumpet too much because, you know, big energy company and all that, but they are really good. I mean, any experience I've had with them talking to their support, they've been fantastic. And in fact, their CEO actually engages with people ordinary people on Twitter, for instance, which I think is a pretty good sign. And uh, they're very open. And the biggest seal of approval comes from my mum, who hates every single company she deals with. But Octopus gets her seal of approval. So well, I can't say much more than that. But if you click the link there at the bottom, then we both get £50. So thank you very much if you do that. OK, so what's next? Apps and RFID cards for cheap charging. Bit of a mouthful, that. So if you've just sat through the last points on here with a bit of a grimace because you don't have off-street parking, I understand completely. It's a bit of a luxury if you have off-street parking with an electric car and it makes it much cheaper, of course. But there are ways you can get cheap charging and in fact, free charging. Lidl and Sainsbury's supermarkets have chargers made by Podpoint. And if you download the Podpoint app, it means you can use their chargers, but make sure you take your cable along because uh, you need that to be able to charge their what's called an untethered charger so it's just a box really with a connector on the side. Aldi have chargers from New Motion. you can use the Octopus card to get that for 37 pence per kilowatt hour. One thing to be aware is that there might be time restrictions so a car park um, may only have like a three hour maximum period or something like that perhaps so just double check that um, so you don't get any kind of overstay fees or something. So these chargers are slow they're anything from three kilowatts, seven kilowatts, 22 kilowatts usually. So you're not gonna fill up your car while you're there, but it's still nice to have, and yes, it's free, so that's great. Assuming no one else is using it, of course. 
So what about rapid charging? Public charging on rapid chargers has gone up so much. If you can save any money you can, then that's great. So you may have heard of RFID cards. I've got a whole load, massive bunch there. But probably the best one that you'll want, if you're in the UK this is, is the Octopus Electroverse one, which looks a bit like that. This works at loads of different networks. So um, Shell Recharge, Osprey, MFG, Ionity, Mer, uh, and loads of them. And what you can do is you rock up to the charger, wave your card, and then the charge starts. So you're not using your bank card, because most chargers these days, you can just use your bank card, but with this, you just use an RFID card. If you're an Octopus customer, it kind of goes onto your bill with Octopus, which is quite neat, I suppose. Um, but you don't have to be an Octopus customer to use it. However, if you are an Octopus customer and you're, and you're on Octopus Go like we are, then you get a discount with some networks. And the discount is actually pretty good. And it encourages you to use the charger at times when electricity is a little bit cheaper. So for instance, Genie Point, you'll get that for 57 pence per kilowatt hour between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m., which is a really good deal actually, assuming the Genie Point charger actually works, of course. Or Osprey, Osprey, I love Osprey. Yeah, you can get that for 63 pence per kilowatt hour between 7 p.m. and 11 p.m. So that's actually 20% off. That's, again, pretty good deal. So if you have any Genie Point or Osprey chargers near you and you can't charge at home, it's worth getting the Electroverse card to be able to use that. So two really good reasons for RFID cards. One is that they tend to be more reliable. The biggest factor that um, I've found anyway with chargers not working tends to be the contactless bit of it, the bank card bit. The payment terminals are a bit rubbish sometimes. So if you can get that out of the equation, then the charger tends to be a little bit more reliable in my experience. So that's one good reason for using RFID cards. The second good reason is you don't have to pay a pre-authorization charge. If you use a bank card, you get charged, I don't know, like 10 pounds or something like that. And if for whatever reason the charger fails and you have to do it again, then you obviously keep getting that authorization charge over and over again, which isn't ideal. So it means public charging isn't as good as it was in the old days, of course, but hey, it's uh, with using a card like that, and there are loads of other RFID cards available that you could look into, and other the apps, in fact, there's apps like Bonnet, which works out cheaper as well. Another option is subscribing to Ellie. Ellie is an RFID an app set up by the Volkswagen Group. That's £14.99 a month, and if you pay that, then it means you get Ionity for only 35 pence per kilowatt hour, which is really good value and it's great if you do a lot of long drives and what i would say just going back to it is zapmap is an app that you really should have if you're in the uk at least other apps that are very good at plug share is another one but um, in the uk at least zapmap is great and it's a good way of finding out which chargers are near you you will get familiar with the chargers near you very quickly and you'll get quite excited when a new one pops up in fact like in canterbury it's which has been terrible for years and years we've now finally got a decent mfg hub very excited about it. Okay, next on the list is a tire inflator. All it takes is a slow puncture and you will just really, really wish you've got one of these in the car. They don't cost that much either. It just plugs into the uh, cigarette lighter socket, 12 volt socket, whatever it's called these days. Get yourself one of these. And not only that, let's talk about tires. We had quite an unexpected cold spell recently and we had some snow, which is kind of unusual really where I am in the down south of England. And this car was sliding around all over the place on its summer tyres. And I know that's obvious, summer tyres are obviously for summer, right? But it's just one of those things that I haven't really thought about. And the previous car we had was the Ionic 5, that was four-wheel drive, and that felt a little bit more sure-footed, really, even on whatever tyres that had, which probably weren't all-season ones, I can't remember. So I went to the tyre place, I put on all-season tyres, these are Cross Climate 2s, and the difference is unbelievable. So the previous ones I had were Efficient Grip, Performance 2, and these are summer tyres, and you can see the difference with the tread, look. I took these back because I've only had them a year. So I'll put them back on um, in late spring, I suppose. But those are the Cross Climate 2s. So much better. You feel such a difference when you're driving. When you see these videos of cars sliding around all over the place that's probably why it's just they haven't got decent tires and while we're on the subject evs have got fantastic torque put it on eco mode if you've got it and that will just restrict the power a little bit and make you less likely to 
start wheel spinning all over the place. Okay, the next one of mine is a little bit of a bugbear of mine, really. It's route planning apps. If you've got an EV, get a better route planner, ABRP. It's uh, available for iPhone and Android. And with a better route planner, it means you can plot a route, tell it what type of car you've got, and it knows the weather based on when you're going to drive, and it will plot it with a pretty good degree of accuracy, and it will tell you where you have to charge, and for how long, roughly, you have to charge. Now, it's not perfect. I mean, I've used a better route planner for as long as I've had an EV, really, and I find it really good for just giving me a very rough guide. But it's not always accurate. I mean, you, sometimes you'll be charging much slower than it thinks and things like that. But, you know, it's pretty good. So get yourself a better route planner. There are others available as well, like one called Pump. But a better route planner tends to be the best, in my experience, tends to be the best. So a better route planner in CarPlay or Android Auto is not very good at all. But what makes it pretty good is if you use live data. And live data means that it actually knows what battery percentage you've got in the car and all that kind of thing. But to be able to hook up live data, you need something called an OBD dongle. It's a little bit for the geeks out there, but bear with me. Down here, you'll see a little flap that you can open out. And there is the OBD port. Okay, that goes in there. So once you have the OBD port plugged in, you can link it up with a better route planner with something called live data. And it means that it will actually get your live battery percentage and it will tell you where you have to charge. It makes it much, much better. Although I'd still argue that in 2023, we shouldn't be faffing around with apps like that and dongles. It should just be that the car does all that for you. And yes, I've said this a million times before, Tesla does it, Volvo, Renault Megane, Polestar, I think Mercedes, Volkswagen. So there are a few brands that do, but uh, not enough. Another option with a better route planner is using Tronity. Um, you can go to tronity.io, uh, set up an account on that, and you can link that to a better route planner. But in my experience, at least with the Hyundai Ionic 5, it was not very good because it didn't update the battery percentage fast enough. But other cars, it might be much better. Okay, for the next one, we're going to open the bonnet. Any regular viewers of this channel will know exactly what's coming next. It's the 12 volt battery. I know, it's ridiculous, isn't it? These horrible old lead acid batteries are still in EVs. And yes, occasionally they do go wrong. So I've had problems with the 12 volt battery in both the Kia e-Niro and the Hyundai Ioniq 5. Like any other car that with a 12 volt battery, they do occasionally go wrong. So this next thing that you really, really need is a car starter. I've used this so many times. It's just a little battery, that's all it is, with jump leads. I'm not going to try and do it on here, but I'm going to link to the video that I did about the Hyundai Ionic 5, if you click up there. This thing is worth its weight in gold, really. Just get it. Click the link below, and it is a referral link, so I do get a bit of cash for it, but uh, this particular one is not available on Amazon anymore. For an EV, any jump starter will work fine. It doesn't have to be particularly high power or anything. Get it, really. If you do start to get a little bit obsessed with 12 volt batteries like I did, then you might want to get one of these battery monitors. It's a really cool little thing that goes on there. It doesn't draw very much power at all, and it's Bluetooth enabled, and it's got an app, and it tells you how healthy the 12 volt battery is. Right, so the next thing on the list is basic knowledge. Okay, so just some basic knowledge then that I think every EV owner should know. And unfortunately, dealers don't do a very good job at telling us all this, because often the dealers don't know themselves. Apologies to any dealers watching this. You're not all as bad as that. So firstly, you may have heard about this. AC, DC, not the Australian band. AC is generally a much slower charge. It's what you get from your home wall box or even when you plug in using the granny cable. The car has something called an onboard charger. And usually this is very, very slow. In the case of this Nissan Leaf, it's 3.3 kilowatts. Um, most EVs tend to be seven kilowatts to 11 kilowatts. Some are 22. Some, like the old Renault Zoe, went all the way up to 43 kilowatts, but then they didn't do DC charging. So it's really important to know how fast your car's onboard charger is, your AC charging. Because if you rock up to a charger, often called a destination charger, yeah, and you plug into it, um, and maybe the charger says it's 22 kilowatts, well, actually, you're, you're only going to get what your car can do, and your onboard charger determines that. So... I would only get 3.3 kilowatts even if I charge on a 22 kilowatt AC charger. So that's AC, but we've also got DC, and a DC plug will either be CHAdeMO for the LEAF or CCS for all other EVs. All of those are DC. If you're charging on DC, you can get a much higher charge rate, and that's because the power goes directly into the battery 
and the car doesn't have to really do very much. So you can get much higher charging rates. The Leaf, for instance, is 50 kilowatts. So if I go to a rapid charger, I get 50 kilowatts of charging as opposed to 3.3 kilowatts if I charge either at home or on an AC charger elsewhere. So it's really important that you know the difference between AC and DC, and that's pretty much it. So the next thing to know is that charging isn't always fast. And this is one of the most frustrating things for new EV owners because you might go up to a charger in the middle of winter and it's really slow. And you're thinking, why? My car can charge at 100 kilowatts. Why am I only getting 50 or something like that? And it's because batteries like to be quite warm. In cold weather, they don't charge as fast. If you get the battery low enough, then sometimes it will, what we call ramping up, it will ramp up and get a bit warmer, a bit warmer, and then maybe you'll see a much faster charging speed. But generally, in the winter, unfortunately, EVs don't tend to charge very fast. There are, again, there are exceptions. Some cars like Tesla, Porsche, and um, uh, the Hyundai Ioniq 5, Kia EV6, they will precondition the battery and then make it nice and warm. So when you do get to a charger, you get pretty much full speed. Generally, though, you might find that you're disappointed by the charge rate. So just bear that in mind. And uh, don't worry, it's perfectly normal, if a little annoying. Charging past 80%, you'll hear this 80% rule quite a lot. Generally, again, it's, this is a complete generalization, not all cars are the same, but if you charge past 80%, around 80%, the charge rate will drop and it starts to get surprisingly slow. In fact, with the Kia e Nero that I used to have, up to 80%, it would charge it in about 44 minutes, I think it is, but it would be like another 44 minutes or something to get from 80% to 100%. So if you're one of those people that likes to charge up to 100, and it's not generally a good idea to because it's just you're wasting your time, then you'll be waiting a long, long time. And you might think that EVs are charging even slower than they actually do. Pretty much all manufacturers will quote an 80% charge when they say how fast a car charges, like the, again, Hyundai Ioniq 5, 18 minutes, they say uh, up to 80%. So yes, sometimes it's better just to charge up to 80% and then drive on to the next charger instead of just waiting around for ages. The GOM, you may have heard of the GOM. If you've watched a few uh, videos from geeks like me that we talk about the GOM quite a lot, it's the gasometer, also the range meter. Don't rely on this. It's one of the biggest things that I read in comments that people are saying, my God, my range has gone down. I woke up, the, the car was, I had 200 miles last night and I've looked now and it's 150. Um, it's just, it's loads of different factors. Generally what the GOM says is based on your previous journeys. So if you've done a lot of around town driving and then you then decide to do a motorway journey, well, you're not going to get the same range, okay? It's just going to, that range is going to drop quite considerably and it's probably going to freak you out a little bit. So it's not accurate. Just as it isn't accurate in um, uh, an ICE car, in a combustion engine car, some cars are better than others. Uh, Kia and Hyundai are really good, okay? So their GOMs are very accurate. They tend to be very accurate. This is a big one next, etiquette. Do you really need 100%? Probably not. As you may have read, infrastructure is not where it needs to be. If you're the kind of person that goes to a charger and then sits at 100%, just in your car, you're waiting to get to 100%, you've waited there for ages, and there aren't many other chargers, and there's a queue, please don't be that person. Because you, unless you really, really need that 100%, then, try to avoid that and just move on and drive on to another charger. Or what you can do is if, if there is an AC charger somewhere, then just go on to that because you're going to be charging at the same rate anyway. But we have to be just a little bit respectful of the fact that we don't have enough rapid chargers around at the moment. Uh, it's a scarce resource right now and uh, try not to block it by charging up to 100%. The one exception to that, of course, is maybe it's not busy. And if it's not busy, then who cares? You can be there all you want. But uh, um, when you are charged up, Please move your car. Don't just let it sit in there because when you are an EV driver, the worst thing is when you're desperate for a charge. There aren't very many chargers around and some moron is parked there not charging. And I've, again, I've also seen people um, who are not even plugged in. So they just use it as their personal parking space. So be respectful. Okay, right, well, the next one is probably something that applies to everyone, uh, not just EV owners, and it's a dash cam. Now, this is a bit of a funny one, okay? So I was talking to my wife. She was saying, I really want a dash cam because there are so many idiots on the road and she wants to record them. Fair enough. I was already thinking about getting a dash cam. And the funny thing is, when you're, um, when you're a YouTuber, 
you get a lot of messages from companies who are desperately trying to sell their wares to you and get you to review their products. And you get a lot of dash cam ones, like one a week, I would say. But the one that actually caught my eye was uh, by a company called 70 My, I think that's how you pronounce it. And it's their Omni, it's their brand new dash cam. And it's pretty funky. And that's what I've got in the car at the moment. It's great fun, yeah, the quality is really good. I say it's great fun because it's got this little character that comes up. I mean. I find it fun, but whether you would, I don't know. It's a cool camera, it swivels, you can take selfies if you really want to. Take selfie. Night vision is really good. Generally, it's just plugged into your cigarette lighter, that's what I've done. But you can hardwire it directly into the car and you can use it for um, uh, parking sensors as well. So if anyone walks near your car, it will do like what Tesla does with sentry mode and it will start up and start recording them. So it's really good um, from my experience so far. Now they sent me this for free. They actually said, we want you to review it and we'll, you know, what are your rates? And I said, no, I want to be impartial. Um, I'm not going to take any money for it. So they said, well, have it for free then. So, all right, fine. So I've got it for free, um, but I'm, got any, I'm not getting any money for it. So um, if you want me to review it like properly, then do let me know in the comments and I will. But so far, so good. Um, it's a decent little dash cam. So get yourself a dash cam. I think we're ready for number one, aren't we? Drum roll. A bit rattly, isn't it? And number one is patience. Anyone would think I was struggling to get to 10 things. I think as an EV driver, that's the main thing that we need to have right now anyway, is patience. And not just patience because uh, cars charge slower than they would do if you had a combustion engine car and you're filling up with petrol. The pay, that whole thing doesn't bother most people because generally if you've got off-street parking or you're charging during the night um, or if you're even uh, charging somewhere else or rapid charging or charging at work then generally you're doing something else while you're charging going and getting shopping or whatever else. So not necessarily patience for that reason but patience for the infrastructure. The infrastructure has a lot of work to do before it's um, reliable enough and um, there, there are enough chargers around because there are massive areas all over the world really where there are just no chargers around and you have to you know do a bit of mental gymnastics to try and think well where can I charge and all that sort of stuff so we need a little bit of patience just for the infrastructure to catch up so EVs are I would say they're better than uh, combustion engine cars in pretty much every way but we just have to be aware that the infrastructure is the weak point at the moment and we need to wait for it to catch up. And finally, patience just for other EV drivers. There are a lot of EV newbies out there, pretty scared. The learning curve is pretty steep, admittedly, and not everyone knows what they're doing. So we all just need to kind of learn to be a little bit patient and just help other people out. There are people that you all come across, unfortunately, EV drivers that couldn't give a stuff about anything other than themselves. Now that's unfortunate, but generally most people are pretty decent and uh, you know, uh, we all just need to help each other a little bit and not just in real life, but also on social media. Patience, I think, goes a long way. And as you may realize, I'm fairly zen, really. So uh, an EV suits me. Um, maybe some angrier people shouldn't have EVs just yet. We're in a transitionary period and that can be a bit of an adventure at times. I would argue it's quite exciting most of the time, but it is a transitionary period. So there are ups and downs. It's not always easy, but um, I think it's quite a lot of fun and uh, just try to enjoy the ride. So thank you very much for watching the video. I hope you found it interesting. And if you have clicked the referral links, then thank you so much. My wife will give me a big hug if you have. So uh, it's much appreciated. If you enjoyed this video, then watch all the others, especially the ones with my wife and um, press the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified of other videos. And I'll be back really soon with another video. Thank you very much. Bye for now.